What were you thinking? Have you ever heard those words? For, for many of us, those words probably bring back memories of our childhood, times where our parents call those out in a strong fashion. What were you thinking? Uh, for others, we may have remembered times where we said those words ourselves, where we were the ones who uttered those words to our children. Typically, those four words, what were you thinking, those four words come out when we're dismayed by something that was just done. Some foolish action was undertaken and disaster has resulted. And, and we're expressing our dismay over that disaster by uttering those words. I know there's times where those words are uttered internally in my mind. I, I say them to myself, wondering what was I thinking I, I wouldn't say it out loud, but I, this week there was a time where I'm carrying my coffee grounds to empty in the garbage, and I get distracted, and I dump them all over the, the carpet. What was I thinking? I probably wasn't. We go on a trip, and we discover that some item that's necessary is not in the, the suitcase. What was I thinking? Of course, we're so used to that, we, we consider it's not a vacation unless there's at least one trip to Walmart because I inevitably leave something behind. There are times that are humorous where we say, what were we thinking? But there's also times where there's not so humorous. I wonder at times when I say something to Grace or someone else that is hurtful, soon as the words come out of my mouth, I'm wondering, what was I thinking? Why would I utter that thought in that fashion? That simple question, what was I thinking? That, that deals with what's going on in our minds because we recognize what goes on in our minds directly affects our actions. There, there's a correlation between our thinking and our actions. That's why we'll, we'll see this morning that what we're thinking is such an important aspect of our Christian love. We we're continuing our series on developing genuine love this morning. For, for several months now, we've been working on de developing genuine love using a list of characteristics that Paul gives us in Romans chapter 12. He, he lists out the things that make up love. We've been using that as a framework, taking the item one by one through that list, examining our lives, evaluating ourselves. How are we doing Verifying that, that the love that we are producing is genuine, is the real Christian thing. Please turn with me once more to Romans chapter 12. Paul begins the, the list of characteristics in verse 9 of, of chapter 12. Paul writes, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We've gotten this far in, in Paul's list, having looked at verse 15 last week. Clearly, Paul is not through teaching us what makes up genuine love. We're not through the, the list yet that goes through the whole chapter. But as far as we've gone, we've already seen a lot of the components that, that make up genuine love. We, we've seen things that our lives should match up to for us to be displaying the love of Christ. We've also gone far enough where we've come to realize that these things are not natural. These things require supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to be there. They are not natural the way they're laid out here. They are things that come to us 
because the Spirit of God lives within us and as we know Christ as Savior. The question I want to ask, even as we get started, how does your life look as you examine yourselves at the things we've already looked at? Remember, this is not an academic exercise. We're not just trying to learn what these words are. And maybe you want, or we're coming hoping that by the time you're through this series, you'll be able to cite the Greek words. Nope, that's not it. This isn't academic. This is us displaying Christ. I am assuming that we are here this morning because we know Jesus as Savior. If you cannot say that for yourself, if, if there's never been a time in your life where you have personally come to accept Jesus as Savior, I encourage you to talk to me after the service. Send me an email at the address on the screen there. I'd love to share with you how you can know Jesus as Savior, know that he died for your sins, and that you will spend eternity with him. Overall, though, I assume that we're here this morning because we know Jesus as Savior. That, that means we want to please him. I assume that we're here knowing him, and if we know him, it's not a question whether we want to please him or not. We do want to please our Savior. That spirit that indwells us at the moment of our salvation, it imparts a desire. The Holy Spirit, he imparts a desire to us to please God. We want to please him. And part of our wanting is this desire to have genuine love. We want to have genuine love. We want to produce that which pleases our Savior, that which is supernatural evidence of Christ's work in our lives. We want to truly love one another as we've seen we ought. I know we want to have genuine love. I also know that we are naturally lazy, sinful people. We have this internal battle going on within us. We, we have this fight. We want to please Christ, but that, that pleasing smashes right up against that old desire to please ourselves, to take the easy way out of life. So how are you doing? Are you taking what we're learning as we go through this list, and are you applying it to your life? Are you allowing the teaching of God's Word through the Spirit's working within you to change you? Are you working to set aside old habits and to develop new habits? Are you thinking about the truths that, that we discuss over these, these weeks? Are you thinking? That gets back to our question. What are you thinking? That really is an important question. What are you thinking? Are you thinking in a way that reflects the transforming work of Christ? Or are you letting your thoughts drift through the, the natural patterns of your old nature? The, this morning, the question of what we are thinking comes to the forefront of, of our text. As we come to the verse 16 in our series, what we are thinking is shown to play a key role in developing genuine love. Look at this verse, our verse for the today. Paul writes, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. In John 13, 35, as I've referenced many times, Paul says love is the defining characteristic of believers. He tells us that, that our Savior himself says, all men will know that we are his disciples by our love for one another. This one another love, it, it requires unity among us. One another means that we are united. We love one another. We cannot love one another without our love being, as I call this sermon, a unified love. We must have unity in our love for one another. Yet our verse this morning is showing us that a unified love is connected to our thinking. We will not have unified love unless we have the right thinking. The, the main idea of our verse that, that develops this morning for us is that unified love requires sanctified thinking. Sanctified thinking. Set apart unto God thinking. That's what sanctified means. Holy thinking. 
Striving for holiness, that type of thinking, is what unified love requires. What we are thinking must be sanctified. It must be transformed by the Spirit working within us so that we become like our Savior. We need that in our lives for our love to be unified love. Unified love requires sanctified thinking. Our verse this morning that we're looking at has three admonitions. You may have sensed that as you read through it. Three instructions, three admonitions, commands, force. That naturally breaks into three parts. It's significant that that every one of these parts, every one of these sections of this verse, in them Paul uses the the word root for to think. It gives the idea of thinking being prevalent. In the original Greek, this root, to think, is used every time, three times in this verse. What we think determines how we love one another. Unified love requires sanctified thinking. The the first admonition we have, is the first section, gives us a basic idea that we should have a certain way of looking at one another to be unified. From it we learn unified love requires considering others as co-recipients of God's grace. We must look at others as as being co-recipients of God's grace. That's the basic idea that we can extract from the first admonition. In in the New American Standard, when I read it, it's translated as, be of the same mind toward one another. The, The King James and the New King James translates it the same way. The ESV and the NIV, they, they take a slightly different approach. They, they translate it as live in harmony with one another. Remember, I said Paul uses the word root for to think in, in all of these admonitions, but sometimes by the time we get it translated into Greek, it is a bit obscured. In, in this first phrase, the, the root to think is found in the command portion that says we are to be of a certain mind. We are to to have a certain mind about us. Paul clarifies the the type of mind we are to have is the same mind. Being of the same mind means that our minds are to be thinking the same way. Now, Now, I want to pause for just a moment so that we think carefully about this. Remember, our focus is thinking here in this verse, so let's think carefully. I want to think our way through what Paul does and does not say when he says, be of the same mind. If all Paul wrote was that part of the phrase, be of the same mind, then we could conclude that we should have uniformity in our thoughts. It would become a violation for me to think differently than Jerry. It would be a violation for Grace to think differently than Bonnie. We should all think the same. That's what uniformity of thought means. If that's what Paul says, then then we ought to encourage the formation of thought police. Those who will go around and censor anyone who who thinks differently than the the proper thought, the the approved, the authorized way of thinking. Well, if you think about it, that's largely how authoritative fascists and dictators operate. There's a reason that our founding fathers took great pains in our country to make sure that we'd have freedom of the press as as a central component of of our political system. They they knew what happened that when the policing of thoughts was authorized by the state, when rulers with corrupted thinking because of sin, when when sinful corruption in rulers would quickly take the, the ability to control the thoughts of the populace and use that to oppress the populace. Sadly, we, we now seem to see a yearning for the same kind of, uh, of thinking policing to become part of a, our political issues in our country. It's become a divisive issue, whether or not we should have thoughts policed. Oppression is what happens when thinking is forcibly controlled in the world. Still, isn't the church a different issue? Isn't the church different? Shouldn't we expect that that we all will think the same way because we all share the Spirit of God? No. I'll answer my own question. No, we should not expect that we will all think the same thing. 
The Spirit of God leads us into the truth of God's revealed Word. The Spirit of God shows us how God's Word applies to our lives. But our lives are different. We have different lives. That means the application of God's Word to our lives will all be different. Plus, when we really get down to it, most of the things that we decide throughout the day, the things that we deal with, are at least directly never revealed in Scripture. I cannot turn to a verse to determine which brand of toothpaste I should use in the morning. For, for that matter, I cannot turn to a verse that explicitly tells me that you should return to church tonight. Now, there are certainly biblical principles that, that apply to all of these decisions. Take the, the decision about whether or not you return to church tonight. There is biblical principles that, that says you are to know God's Word. There are commands that tell you not to neglect the assembly together. You are to find opportunities to encourage one another. And so on. There are a lot of commands in Scripture that apply to the question of whether or not you should return tonight or not. These principles, when they combine, they, they suggest that, that coming to church tonight is a wise application of God's revelation for your life. Probably. But, at the same time, if you are a husband whose wife happens to end up in the hospital tonight, the biblical command to love your wife probably means that the wisest application of God's truth for your life is that you will sit by her bedside this evening rather than return to church. God's revelation guides us as the Spirit applies it to our life. But what Paul is writing here does not mean that we are expected to think exactly the same. It's not a command to have uniform thinking within the church. God has made us different. He's given us different lives. He's given us different experiences. Some of us may like one color of carpeting and some may like another. Great. Some may like one color of paint. Someone else might like different. Same with Bible translation. Same with song selection. Same with every decision that has to be made about our assembling together. We don't have to have the exact same thoughts, the same likes. So if Paul is not requiring uniformity of thought, what is he requiring as part of genuine love? Well, notice, Paul qualifies the command to think the same. He qualifies this command to be of the same mind with the words, toward one another. There is no expectation that we will all think alike. There is an expectation that we will all think the same way toward one another. Remember, this entire letter of Romans is written about the marvelous salvation that we all share. We've received this salvation. All of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior, as I said, my, my assumption is that in a group this size, not everyone fits that category, and if not, talk to me afterwards. There's likely someone who has not accepted Jesus as Savior, but Paul's assumption in this letter is this letter is going to those who know Jesus as Savior. I trust that the Spirit will convict any of you who need to know him to come talk to me. Still, most of us are co-recipients of God's grace. We had nothing to offer God. We, we had nothing but rebellion on our resume. When we stood before God and had our interview for salvation and handed out our resume, the only thing we had on it was rebellious sinner. We had nothing to offer. Yet God chose to shower his grace on us. That's what God did. He saved us through his grace alone. And that is true for each and every one of us who has Jesus as Savior. So when we look around at the people gathered here, what we ought to see are grace recipients. These are people just like us, undeserved sinners saved by grace. They're, they're valuable because God saved them. And for that reason alone, I do not want to hurt 
the other people sitting here. I do not want to offend the other people sitting here. I do want not want to discourage them. Rather, I want to worship with them, and I want them to worship with me. Those are the kind of thoughts that should be uniform among us. It's not because thought police are, are forcing us to think this way. It's because we recognize this reality that God, through his grace, has saved every person that is here worshiping alongside us. It's our joy in God's transforming grace within us that we want to think this way toward one another. Friends, if your first thought when you saw someone in church today is, oh man, I don't know if I have it in me to deal with him today. Maybe I'll sit on the other side of the auditorium. If that's your first thought, you have a problem. Your first thought should be, when you see that person, there is a co-recipient of God's grace. I am going to think of him that way today. Yes, within the church, we have different personalities. We have different gifts. We have different experiences. We have different thoughts. Yet we should also have a harmony through unified love. Unified love requires sanctified thinking. The first admonition in our verse teaches us that unified love re requires considering others as co-recipients of God's grace. Moving on to the second admonition. From the second admonition that Paul gives us, we learn that unified love requires leaving no room for arrogance in our thoughts. No room for arrogance. One of the commentators I read this week observed that the greatest barrier to unity is pride. So in the second admonition, Paul deals directly with pride. He uses the exact same word as he used in the first admonition, even though we probably cannot see it in our English. The, the word that was translated in the first admonition is be of mind, that the word that was the root from thinking. He uses that same word, the exact same word, when he tells us to not think in exalted, lofty fashion. In other words, don't be arrogant in your thoughts. Do you struggle with arrogant thinking? If your internal answer was no, then you need to change it. That answer alone tells me you probably do. We all tend to think, at least in some areas, that we are smarter and wiser than we really are. There, there are some areas of life in which we are truly better informed and, and trained than others, and, and it's not arrogance to assert our informed opinions. At the same time, there's also, also likely areas where we hold exalted opinions without truly having a firm foundation for those opinions. Now, I'll likely make some people angry here this morning by, by pointing out the last couple of years of the COVID pandemic has demonstrated this time over time over time. People have made strong statements about the viralness of, of the disease, the virality of the disease, and, and they've made strong opinions about the, the validity of the vaccines, and, and they have denounced anyone who would disagree with them. You go on the internet and you find it full of these kinds of assertions. At times, you find churches full of these assertions. And yet, most of the people making these statements have no access to actual data in which to make informed assessments, nor do most of the people making the statements have the background education necessary for understanding the epidemiology in, involved in the pandemic or the virology involved in the vaccine development. What these opinions are is a haughtiness of mind when they're presented as firm facts. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to question some of the information that's being repeated in our media. Our media, by and large, doesn't have the background either. Nor is it wrong to doubt the motivation of some of the political players that got involved as the whole question became a, a political decision-making matter. What I'm pointing to is the lack of humility in the manner in which many opinions were stated. 
It's one thing for people in the world to state things with haughtiness of mind. It's another for Christians to do it. Having arrogance about the validity of our own thoughts is a common sin problem that that we all struggle with. It's common because it's a component of pride. The the good news is that Paul gives us the antidote to to this problem. He says, rather than than having this haughty opinion of ourselves, rather than, than, than sticking with our own pride, he says, associate with the lowly. Rather than thinking too highly of ourselves, we should associate with the lowly. Or some translations have be accommodating toward the lowly. The the phrase that Paul writes simply means that that rather than thinking highly of ourselves, we're to allow ourselves to be carried away or, or be led away by the lowly. Now Paul doesn't specify in his antidote the lowly what? The way he writes his solution to arrogance here in the original language, he could be referring to associating with lowly people or with lowly tasks. A a solution to thinking haughty could be hanging out with the the people that our society tends to overlook, those who are the lowly, and then seeing them as equal. A solution could also be doing lowly tasks, doing the things that our society would say is beneath your position. Some commentators suggest that Paul intentionally left himself vague. He just threw out, associate with the lowly and dropped it there because both things are true and both ideas are solutions to pride. As it comes up in your life, use the appropriate association with the lowly to cure your pride. We should never think that we are too good for other people. Nor should we think that we are too good for certain tasks that that need to be done. Both of these things are needed in the church, that's for sure. Think about it. In Paul's day, when he's writing this, slaves could be found right alongside their masters in the church. Can can you imagine what it would be like for a newly saved master to, to join a church where his slave was already in a position of leadership? As I've said before, slavery at this time was not race-based like the sordid history of slavery here in America. It wasn't based on race, yet slavery was still demeaning to a person's humanity. A slave in the Roman Empire was fully owned by the master. It's easy to see how a master might think after the church gathered and had their love feast and and had that love feast together and this communal meal that they would have together, it's easy to see how the master might think, well, my slave, slave should clean up the mess and, and take care of all the dishes. It's also pretty easy to see how a slave who was owned by his master might think when he's in the position of authority over his master, this is my true position. I am a greater man than him. There's a danger of arrogance for both the slave and the master. But in the church, there's there's no room for either if the church was to have unified love. Well, by God's grace, we don't have slavery today. But, But that doesn't mean that we don't still deal with the same issues of arrogance because we have the same sinful nature. Do you complain when the towel roll is empty in the restroom? Or do you go look for a roll so you can refill it? Do you step over the piece of paper on the the floor, assuming someone else will pick it up? Do you consider every person in this church your peer? Or or do you mentally place yourself higher than some? Arrogance in our thoughts destroys the unified love in our church, even if we largely manage to hide it in our actions. We must uproot arrogance in our thinking, in our pursuit of genuine love. We must. Our sanctification requires it. Unified love requires sanctified thinking. That means unified love requires leaving no room for arrogance in our thoughts. That's Paul's second admonition. We must clean out our thoughts. Pride has no room. Moving to the third, the last 
admonition this morning. Moving to that one, we learn that thirdly, unifying love requires measuring our love by God's standards. Measuring our love by God's standards. Look one more time at Paul's final admonition here in verse 16. Paul writes, Do not be wise in your own estimation. The, the word that we have translated wise, again, that comes from that same word root that means to, to think. Paul's really dealing with thinking in a manner that, that we would consider wise or, or prudent thinking. That's why it's translated as wise. If the, the thinking in a way that exercises good judgment is prudent. Well, there are several places in Scripture where we're told we should pursue wisdom. For example, Proverbs 23.19 says, Listen, my son, and be wise, and direct your heart in the way. Similarly, Proverbs 27.11 says, Be wise, my son, and make my heart glad, that I may reply to him who reproaches me. Being a person with wisdom is a good thing. It's something that the Bible says we are to seek after. But we have to understand we're talking about biblical wisdom. Biblical wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. It's gaining an understanding of what God has said and then putting that into application in our lives, taking his revelation and applying that to the situations that God providentially brings into our lives. Biblical wisdom falls by the wayside when God's revelation is replaced by our own opinions. And that is the problem that Paul is warning us of. Pursuing wisdom by the standards that uses our opinions to gauge what is good or what is prudent, rather than God's revelation. When, when we begin to gauge things by our thinking, we start to follow the path of the fool rather than the path of the wise. I expect, once again, this is one of these ideas that's easy for us to understand. We, we get the, the concept. But we also set this understanding aside all too easily when, when God's revelation doesn't make sense to us. Why would we submit to the governing authorities over us when their policies seem contrary to everything that we consider right? Sure, God tells us to, but, but how is that wise? Why would we pray for their well-being when, when they are pushing ungodly policies into legislation? Sure, God tells us to, but, but how is that wise? The same sort of question comes up in practically every area of life. Why should I submit to my parents when they don't understand me? Why should I show kindness to my neighbor when he is mean to my children? Why should I work cheerfully for my boss when he fails to reward my efforts? Our lives are filled with these why questions. Questions that all too often are times we allow our own opinions and feelings to govern what we do rather than God's word. We develop that pattern in life and then we bring that pattern into the church. Why would I give my support to the budget of this church when there's some items in it that I consider unimportant? Why would I participate in the, the outreach activities of the church when, when those activities make me uncomfortable? Why would I overlook the insensitive statements of another member when I can so easily defend myself and, and prove him just be ignorant? Why? 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 Because God tells us what to do within the church. And most of the time, what God tells us to is contrary to our own opinion of what makes sense. God tells us that unity within the church is a higher priority than our own personal concerns. God tells us that unity in the church causes the gospel to shine magnificently to the, the world around us. God tells us to submit our desire to the collective will of the church assembly so that we can display unity. God tells us that the problem is not wisdom. The problem is the standard by which we judge wisdom. The moment we use our own estimation, when we use our own opinion, our own thinking, if the standard by, by which we determine what is wise, we fail. 
We, we cannot lose sight of, of the goal. Genuine love. Genuine love, this characteristic that, that shows the world that Christ is all in all. Genuine love is a unified love. And unified love is measured by God's standard, by His revealed Word, not by our opinions. Using God's Word to, to measure wisdom is evidence of sanctified thinking. Unified love requires sanctified thinking. Unified love requires measuring our love by God's standards. What are you thinking? That's the question that, that we ask when we see foolish actions undertaken. As we've seen this morning, it's also a question that we should be asking ourselves continually as we have a genuine desire to, to find genuine love. And in this quest, we need to ask ourselves over and over, what am I thinking? We need to ask that because unified love re requires sanctified thinking. Am I thinking sanctified thoughts? We need to evaluate continually whether our thinking is sancti sanctified because that alone will produce genuine love. Uh, the kind of love that, that genuinely unifies the church. The, this morning, Paul gives us three admonitions in, in the verse we've looked at. From these, we, we learn three things about unified love. First, unified love requires considering others as co-recipients of God's grace. Two, it requires leaving no room for arrogance in our thoughts. And three, it requires measuring our love by God's standards. Again, how are you doing? How are you doing as far as unified love goes? Are you developing genuine love? Are you learning from the principles here and then going about your life as you always have? You know, we, we hear this Sunday morning, you, you've heard these three principles now from this, the, that how you should have sanctified thinking, saying that was all well and good, but I'm going to walk out this door and my week, week will be the same? Are you leaving here praying that God will use the Spirit to transform your life and working to set out what set out from your life all the things that God has revealed to you that should not be part of your thinking and develop habits to bring in what should. This morning, that is the challenge. Our minds, thinking. We must allow the Spirit to transform our thinking, to, to sanctify the way that we think about life. And we must do that because unified love requires sanctified thinking. Let's pray. Father, this morning we've been challenged by your word in the deepest area of our life, our thoughts, the area that we can keep hid from everyone but you. Father, you alone know whether our thoughts are sanctified thoughts or not. And Father, you alone know that many of our thoughts remain unsanctified. So I pray this morning that you would send your spirit to do a work within each of us. Bring conviction where we need conviction. And bring transformation so that Christ is glorified, magnified, proclaimed through the way we live our lives. Because our thinking matches up to your thinking. Father, we want to do this so that we please you. So that we reflect the great love that we receive from you in the love that we return by living in obedience and conformity, developing the image of our Savior. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.